Thanks again for joining us today for today's event, the Supreme Court after Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm Mackie O'Keefe, Bowdoin class of 21, and I'm coming to you today from my off-campus house in Brunswick. Um, and I'd like to thank and introduce our three panelists. But before we get to that, a few details um, I'd like to share. I encourage everyone to submit questions in the Q&A button, and we'll get to as many as we can um, during the second half of the program. Closed captioning is available and can be turned on the bottom of the screen. And finally, uh, we will be recording this event uh, and it will be shared on the Connect page of the Alumni Relations website. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'm honored to share the screen today with these three noted alumni. First, our moderator, Katie Benner. Katie graduated from Bowdoin in 1999 and covers the US Department of Justice for the New York Times. At the Times, Katie was part of the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for public service in 2018 for her reporting on workplace sexual harassment issues. And we're delighted to have her joining us today from Washington, DC. Thanks, Katie. Next, Nancy Bellhouse May. Nancy is a member of Bowdoin class of 1978. After practicing law, she joined the Journal of Appellate Practice and Process in 2001 and retired as its editor this past summer. A graduate of Columbia Law School, Nancy has followed the appellate courts for more than 30 years and is coming to us today from Arkansas. Thank you, Nancy. And Dennis Hutchinson. Dennis studied at both Oxford University and the University of Texas at Austin. After graduating from Bowdoin in 1969, he clerked for three federal justice judges, including Justice Byron White and William Douglas. He began his teaching career at Georgetown University and is joining us today from Chicago, where he's the professor at the law school. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, now it's my pleasure to thank you all for joining us for the event and to turn things over to Katie Benner. Hi, thank you. Mackie, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I think everybody should know that Mackie is studying the impact of um, political rhetoric on the Supreme Court right now. He worked for summer at the Department of Justice and all of his professors say that he's a Supreme Court junkie. So it's hard to imagine somebody better to uh, open our conversation today. And also thank you so much to Nancy, Dennis and to Bowdoin for having us here. Since we have a lot to talk about, I think we'll jump right in. If you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A queue at whatever point during uh, our talk um, that it strikes you. I think that there are also a lot of questions. We want the audience to participate as much as possible. So I will be trying to work those in throughout the discussion and we'll have formal Q&A also at the end. So please jump in with your thoughts. I really appreciate them. And I wanted to start with a very funny anecdote that Dennis told us as we were preparing for this. Uh, session, you know, he taught with Marty Ginsburg, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg's husband for about a year. And he said that, that Marty said, you know, Ruth is not a liberal, Ruth has a cause. And I thought that was very interesting. I thought it was, you know, uh, a really in great lens through which to look at the legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because she has left such a huge impact on the court. Well, something I didn't expect. I, when I was teaching at Georgetown, uh, Judge Ginsburg was appointed to the DC circuit and Marty moved with her uh, from New York and uh, took a teaching assignment at Georgetown. And I was sitting in my office one day with uh, two other uh, colleagues, uh, both of whom were really quite liberal. Uh, the door was open and uh, Marty came by, classic Marty figure, traveling at top speed down the hall and carrying a cigarette like this. He always did that. And I asked him once why he did it, he said, well, it keeps the ash from falling on the floor as easily. Anyway, so he pops in, still holding a cigarette, saying, why do you all think that Ruth is a liberal? Ruth is not a liberal. Ruth has a cause, but she's not a liberal. And then he was gone. And that it made me think really from uh, that day forward uh, to watch where she picks her spots. And to be sure, she was on uh, as a uh, journalist, uh, with all respect, uh, Katie, and scholars tend to do left side of the court, right side of the court, uh, liberal conservative, that sort of thing. Uh, but where she was uh, most aggressive and most effective uh, was in questions of equality, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly equality with respect to women and her famous leading opinion uh, in uh, VMI. Uh, where the old Virginia Military Institute, which had been all male from its founding, uh, she concluded for a majority of the court 
uh, violate a deep or textual clause of the 14th Amendment. But when you got to questions of criminal justice, she was more nuanced uh, and uh, did not always uh, side uh, with uh, the defendant uh, or with the plaintiff in a, a, a suit against uh, the police and it seemed to take a, a more balanced or uh, measured uh, view. Uh, so she was in a way even better uh, then she's being lionized, uh, in my view, uh, today, uh, because he took, she took her job very, very seriously. Uh, she was very careful. Uh, she was not a knee-jerk uh, vote. Uh, and if you talk uh, to lawyers who argue before the Supreme Court, they say they feared her more than anyone else on the bench. She almost always asked the first question, uh, and it was always one that, uh, as one of my friends said, pins you right to the rostrum and, and dared you to climb off it. Uh, she was also one of the hardest working justices in the building. And I've sent a lot of uh, clerks uh, on uh, from the law school uh, eventually to the Supreme Court. And they always said she was there morning, noon, and night. Uh, and that uh, you simply couldn't outwork her. So that's, uh, there's a, so much larger a dimension uh, to who Ruth Bader Ginsburg was than our association with her uh, as a great advocate uh, for women's equality, as uh, a lawyer, uh, a fierce uh, a protector of women's rights on the Supreme Court. Yes, for the most part, but so much more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dennis, thank you so much for that. And, you know, Nancy, I want to turn to you because in Dennis's recollection, his description of, of Ginsburg, we have a incredibly fierce intellect, somebody who is more than well prepared for anything and who is seen, who is basically her name is synonymous with the idea of equality and equality through the law. So how does that color, uh, you know, are the public's reaction to Justice Amy Coney Barrett's recent confirmation and how we see Barrett vis-a-vis -vis Ginsburg. I think there is, there's no way to answer that without pointing to the larger political situation, which colors everything of this sort today. So with that as background, I think there is some recognition at a base level that they're both women who, project a seriousness of purpose, who take their jobs as the center of their professional attention and intend to do a good job as they see a good job. Beyond that, I think things kind of diverge. Um, my impression of people's respect in general for Justice Ginsburg is that people see her as having carefully step by step throughout her life, even you know, as an as a law student, as an advocate, as a young lawyer with the ACLU, just step by step moving along to where she thought she ought to be, where she thought the law ought to be. And I think people correctly or incorrectly see Justice Barrett as just kind of being swept along on a wave to be where she is. That may well be unfair, but I, I remember during her um, hearing, which seems forever ago, although it's only what, a, a week and a half, um, someone almost you know, finger pointingly said to her, well, is it a surprise that you were um, put on the list of prospective, prospective justices just after that comment of yours about the chief justice appeared in print? And, so I think the, the public view is very different of the two of them at this point. And we won't, uh, I think it's, it's one of those things that you're going to have to leave to history until we got some critical distance from both of them to know, you know whether any of this is correct, whether the comparisons are right. I, I think it was Senator Blackburn at the end of the hearing summing up said, well, you're actually very much alike. And you know she ticked off things that she thought were the same. There are people I think who would say that those were not necessarily the, the comparisons they would draw. But I think no one really knows because Judge Barrett has 
certainly to the public at large, I would think, almost no public profile beyond the fact that she was on the approved list. That's what people know about her. Well, she hasn't cultivated it. No. Uh, uh, in part, uh, and uh, with all respect to uh, the coastal media, uh, it's harder to cultivate uh, a public image uh, in the Midwest than it is if you're on Manhattan Island uh, or in Los Angeles. Uh, and that just uh, hasn't been her agenda. Uh, she's just done what she wanted to do uh, and forged uh, ahead. Uh, and it's hard to gainsay uh, her achievement. Uh, you know, graduating first in her class in law school and, you know, according to uh, uh, former clerks I had, of course, on the Seventh Circuit, uh, uh, absolutely top flight in terms of preparation and analysis. Uh, she has just done her job. Now, she's almost, uh, uh, from uh, the Federal Society standpoint, uh, <clears throat> a gift from the gods. Uh, brilliant academic, uh, perfect uh, uh, law school uh, record, uh, distinguished uh, teaching career, fiercely uh, conservative uh, by any sort of measure, uh, and mother of seven children uh, and a, a biracial family, including uh, two uh, adoptions and one Downs child. I mean, that, that's, you know, the, the script writer uh, would be laughed out of a, a producer's office mm -hmm. uh, with uh, that sort of resume. Mm -hmm. uh, she's just ideal. And so uh, as soon uh, as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, either retired or was forced to retire, uh, it was quite clear from the standpoint of the Federal Society of people I know that Amy Coney Barrett was uh, heads above uh, any other candidate. She just fit the bill, you know, and you tick off every box, uh, and she was there. So I have to have a lot of respect for, you know, what she's accomplished uh, and, you know, what sort of a life she's put together. I think and, I discussed this too, that there was this, this sort of mirrors um, past Supreme Court nominations and confirmations, including uh, the confirmation of, um, you know, uh, what, you know, this, this mirror should pass Supreme Court nominations where we've seen a liberal justice be replaced by a far more conservative leaning justice. And to your point about the Federal Society, this is the culmination of a decades long project by the Republicans to move the court in a more conservative direction after believing that the courts had been very, very liberal and had been used to set a liberal agenda in the country. Now, what is interesting about this is that Chief Justice Roberts has written a handful of opinions that have actually favored court precedent over conservative legal views. And I'm wondering two things, can a Chief Justice be a conservative or a liberal when the institution of the court has moved in a singular direction? And how does this court uh, create challenges for Roberts? I don't know, Nancy, do you wanna begin? Well, I think uh, Jen Dennis will probably have a, a deeper analysis of this, but I actually have been thinking a great deal about the Chief Justice since um, Justice Barrett's nomination was made public. Um, it changed Dennis. I, I think it was your Justice White who said that each new justice creates an, a whole new court. And that's certainly true in this case, it seems to me. I mean, obviously the center of the court moves in a in a very different direction by more than one step. Um, so that, um, I hate to put this as, you know, in some kind of flippant um, description, but it almost gives the Chief Justice a, a series of choices about what he does. Does he say, well, I'm irrelevant now because the people who want to push the so-called Federalist Society agenda forward um, can do it without me. Those, those people can, can try the lawn by themselves. Does he assert control instead and leap in front of that group and say, okay, all of us, let's charge. Does he step back and um, say, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm just irrelevant and, you know, kind of do what he does brilliantly. Um, I, I am a great admirer of the Chief Justice. Um, 
But I, I do think this puts him in a very different position than I think he would have expected to be at this point. Although, you know, I think he's someone who came up through the process. Um, you know, he is a, a Federalist Society member and, you know, worked in uh, the Justice Department under Republican presidents and, you know, has been someone who has, <clears throat> excuse me, been aware of and in fact part of that grand judicial project. He worked but on, on the other hand, oh, go as ahead. A, as a lawyer. Pardon but me? I, I, he worked on Bush versus Gore yes. as a lawyer. Yes. I mean, his credentials go back a long way. Yeah. Let me say two things quickly uh, about uh, the Chief Justice. Uh, point number one is uh, Roberts is an institutionalist. Exactly. He's deeply concerned uh, about the vision of the Supreme Court in terms of how it's perceived, thus its legitimacy, that it is a court of law, that just calling balls and strikes or you know, whatever fairy tale you want to apply to it. Uh, but he takes it very seriously. Uh, and uh, the best example of that, of course, is the ruling on the Affordable Care Act of mm -hmm. uh, is, where everyone expected that as a good conservative, uh, he would roll and hold it unconstitutional. But the last thing he was going to do was have the Affordable Care Act invalidated by a vote of five to four with five uh, Republicans voting against four Democrats. Mm -hmm. He knew how bad that would be uh, for the Supreme Court. So, so Dennis, based on this example, I, I want to ask you a slightly more specific question that just came in then from Jeff Emerson, you know, based on your example here, I think it's very interesting. He said, now that we have a court which is dominated by conservatives, if not originalists, how do you think the court will deal with the question of precedent, or of, of stare decisis, but of precedent? How will they deal with this? to your point, sort of a more institutionalist stance now that we have this very right-leaning court? Um, two points in response uh, uh, to that, uh, Katie, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's terribly important. Mm -hmm. uh, point number one is uh, kind of the second notion I have with respect to the Chief Justice. He still has a lot of power. Uh, if he is in the majority, he's going to be assigning the opinions and the opinion assignment power is one of the most precious ones that he has, because if they have a very uh, closely uh, divided court, uh, it's five to four, he can assign it to the person who he thinks will write the narrowest judgment and still get uh, five votes, uh, as opposed uh, to somebody who's gonna scorch the earth. Uh, point number two is that uh, with respect to precedent, uh, that is hard to tell now because uh, there are at least uh, two justices who say uh, anything's up for grabs. Uh, frivolously, uh, one might say, Marbury versus Madison could be overruled. But uh, Justice Clarence Thomas uh, and uh, uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh come very close to saying that. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, Barrett has made uh, uh, motions in that direction in her non-judicial writings. Uh, but uh, when uh, the court uh, overrules uh, one of its prior precedents, uh, all sorts of things uh, intended and unintended happen. A rule gets changed and suddenly uh, it's uh, uh, the lawyer's relief day. Well, if that's up for grabs, what about this decision? Well, if that's up for grabs, then why do we take this ancillary issue associated with it? Uh, and the court is very uh, liberal or conservative, is very leery uh, of starting off litigation cascades. Mm -hmm. So that complicates the answer to your question, even if we could predict individual behavior, Katie. That's great, that's great. I wanna move a little bit away um, and move a little bit closer to home to Bowdoin actually, um, to the case that I had mentioned to you earlier of uh, uh, Chike Uzabunum. Uh, I'll just read the top of a story that my colleague Adam Liptak wrote, that basically a few years ago, a college student in Georgia stood on a stool outside a campus food court to talk about his Christian faith. 
He spoke for 20 minutes about human frailty and the possibility of salvation when school officials told him he had to stop or face discipline. And this fall, SCOTUS will hear arguments on whether or not this student can sue the officials for violating his First Amendment rights when they enforced what was considered a particularly severe version of school speech codes that have become commonplace at many colleges around the nation. You know, so I am curious about what you think of the case and where you think Barrett might fall in this case and what the implications overall uh, are for a SCOTUS ruling on uh, this student's case for life here at Bowdoin as we think about campus free speech issues. I mean, and whoever wants to go first can take that. The problem here is that uh, the regulation that the plaintiff challenge got changed uh, during the course of the litigation. And so the question the court's facing now is, uh, can it uh, decide the, uh, the broad question when that question is out and the only issue that's left uh, is whether the plaintiff can seek nominal damages uh, for being deprived of his free speech rights. And uh, there's a split in the circuits uh, uh, as uh, you know, and as Adam uh, uh, outlined, and I'm not sure that the court wants to take something this volatile uh, to uh, decide essentially a technical issue, uh, a circuit split over whether nominal damages keep an otherwise moot case alive. Uh, particularly when, you know, courts change. Uh, my old boss, Justice White, used to say, uh, every time a new person joins the court, it's a new instrument. And what that means is everybody stands back and uh, assesses what their priorities are, what they think they can now accomplish. He or she who wanted to hear only these types of cases is gone. Uh, do we have a free fire zone with respect to this type of precedent? Uh, and I think that's what makes it uh, very hard to uh, predict outcomes. Uh, but uh, it does mean uh, that I, I think the court will be circumspect for probably an entire term. Now, I could be proven wrong uh, in January without question, uh, but that's the behavior historically uh, of courts who uh, move to the left uh, or to the right on the basis of one vote. And Nancy, do you want to jump in about how a case like this could have um, implications for, you know, either specifically for Bowdoin for free speech in general? Actually, I was thinking of something else, but uh, <laughs> that's good. That's great. I will. Uh, I will defer to uh, Dennis's expertise on uh, on that point. Um, before you were the first time um, I've ever heard those words come out of your mouth. <laughs> well, goodness, I should have been saying them over and over again all these years. But um, before you came on, uh, Katie, Dennis, and I were talking about that case, and I said that you know I spent some time with um, Justice Barrett's writings, but I had not specifically been looking, you know, for the substantive topics of the uh, cases that she had written in. And I said, I, I have no idea what her thoughts are on free speech. Um, so what you heard from Dennis is, is fine by me. Um, just, just, uh, Justice, and I'm getting used to it, Justice Barrett's uh, uh, views with respect to the protection of religious liberty, expression of religious values, uh, seems to be one of the very fervent parts uh, of her philosophical makeup. Uh, and she really wants to protect those who want to express those religious views through some sort of activity, whether it's not providing uh, contraceptive relief uh, as an employer uh, or something else along those lines. So that, that's what makes it even more complicated. This is, this is a hot button area for her. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, we're going to start taking some questions from, from the audience, but I did want to just as a food for thought question to broadly um, frame some of the things I'm going to be asking from the audience. We should, we should start thinking about whether or not the idea of equality, I think, is inherently a liberal idea because to Dennis's point about Amy Coney Barrett, she is very, very, very dedicated to religious freedom. Um, I think there is uh, you know, a lot of talk, especially in conservative circles and amongst federal society members that, you know, especially people who are Christian have, have been, um, you know, have seen rights taken away. So again, like we, we wanna keep in mind uh, that we'll be constantly interrogating in the back of our own minds whether or not 
equality is inherently liberal or liberal or why not, as we sort of move to the big questions of the court that are before the court now with Amy Coney Barrett on the court. With Justice Barrett, we're going to look at um, a lot of things that were part of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy, including Roe versus Wade, Dennis had mentioned, um, the ACA. I think one, one of the questions from uh, the uh, audience is, you know, now that RBG is gone, who will take on the leadership and interest that she took on civil procedure cases? So RBG, as, you know, in the Shady Grove case. And also I think we should expand that to who broadly do you think will take up some of the issues of equality, however we define that, that RBG uh, was known for when she was on the court? I think it's it's fair to say that um, both Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor have addressed those issues in sometimes in, in quite ringing language. Um, justice Breyer, I think you know he was a he was an administrative law professor before he became a justice. He is very interested in um, procedure and keeping the trains on the tracks and that sort of thing. But also has of course the a broad range of intellectual interests and certainly has uh, not shied away from um, forming um, as, as much as one can um, a First Amendment philosophy um, in religion cases, in speech cases. Which one of them emerges as the great champion? I don't know. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't bet on uh, on any one of them, um, I have a secret favorite, but I'm not. Um, I'm not willing to disclose it at the moment. That'll be our next panel. <laughs> well, you know the, the funny thing about Elena Kagan, uh, who I know reasonably well because uh, she taught in Chicago uh, when I was there, uh, is that she's someone who likes to find middle ground and compromise. And well, I'll I'll go that way, but uh, only if you don't go too far. Uh, so that champion of equality, uh, I think, is kind of a, a misnomer to apply to Supreme Court justices. Uh, and I, I think to be looking for the next Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is a will of the wisp. Uh, we'll, ha we'll have to see. The other thing to keep in mind uh, is uh, Justice Douglas was told when he uh, joined the Supreme Court by uh, Chief Justice Hughes, you know, Douglas, it's going to take you five years to go around the track once in this building. Uh, that is to figure out what you really care about, what your agenda is, uh, what you can compromise on and what you can't compromise on. And when you think about that, if you look at, say, Chief Justices, uh, what are their agendas? Justice Rehnquist uh, had two things that he hated and, and wanted to gut. Uh, one was Roe versus Wade, which he was one of the original dissenters along with Justice White. Uh, and the second one was the exclusionary rule. And he succeeded marginally on the second by getting a good faith uh, exception uh, adopted. Uh, what about Chief Justice Roberts? Uh, what has he hated? Uh, he has uh, certainly uh, hated uh, federal interference uh, with uh, state activity, uh, see uh, uh, the Holder case, Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, Voting Rights Act of 1964, didn't like it. Uh, Voting Rights Act of 65. Uh, and it, it, other than that, the man who can write Sibelius and uphold the Affordable Care Act uh, is someone who can take a pragmatic approach to the management of the federal system as it encounters the Supreme Court. You know, I think that there are a lot of questions coming in about RBG. Um, I think, so I'll try to take them all together. Uh, they've come in from a variety of places. You know, RBG, she's known for a very strategic approach to civil liberties. Um, which results actually in her opinion in Roe versus Wade. Other people have asked, is there anybody, what is happening now? So there are a couple of big cases I think we see bubbling up around civil civil rights issues, whether it's the admissions, college admissions cases um, where the Justice Department has sued certain colleges and 
the uh, SCOTUS has, look, has looked at Harvard um, cases around religious freedoms. You know, what is going on sort of below the Supreme Court level that is causing these cases to bubble up? Um, is there somebody who's emerging, I guess, be below the SCOTUS level as an RBG-like figure who strategically brings cases before the Supreme Court? That's one sort of bucket of questions. And then another bucket of questions would be for the big cases, I think especially RVW, there's specific interest there. What do you think is going to happen to that decision? So let's, I, we can just take them in order. Nancy, you want to start? No, Dennis, I was going to say, do you want to start? I, I will say that I'm not aware of any one person who is, um, well, I, I, any one lawyer who is behind those cases in the way that say Thurgood Marshall step by step paved the way that led to Brown, um, the way Justice Ginsburg, when she was an ACLU lawyer, step by step paved the way for that series of decisions that opened women to, as she put it, you know, full citizenship status. I, I'm not aware that there is someone doing that in the lower courts, any, any one lawyer who is, is that dominant either by default or by intention. I may be wrong about that uh, because it's not, it's not something I've studied. I, things came to me in my job and my job required me to you know, be aware of developments in the courts. But that level of granular detail, I seldom saw. So I, I, I will just leave it at, I'm not aware of someone who is doing that. That's not to say there isn't someone out there who is. Well, I think we have to keep our uh, eye on the larger picture. In the first place, Thurgood Marshall wasn't a one-man band. True. Uh, he was the head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Inc. Fund. Uh, and that spawned little Inc. Funds uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and, you know, for every achievement, uh, there's a counterachievement uh, for, you know, the Brown and the boards of the world. Uh, there is going to be resistance and the resistance uh, to a legal decision may be another legal decision. And so that uh, encourages uh, uh, right wing uh, for uh, shorthand purposes, organizations uh, to pop up, whether it's uh, 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 the business round table or, you know, some other group uh, uh, organized to vindicate religious freedom or the like. This is one of the problems with uh, putting too much weight on judicial decisions. Exactly. Uh, and, and this has been a, a criticism that now goes back more than 50 years. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, unstable way of achieving social change. Uh, and my colleague, Jerry Rosenberg at the University of Chicago uh, wrote a book that just upended uh, everybody's uh, Sunday morning coffee uh, called The Hollow Hope that said, uh, you know, you may achieve a victory one day, but what happens the next day? There's a new lawsuit filed with a new wrinkle by organization on the other side. And the best example of this, of course, uh, is abortion. Absolutely. I think that's the question around Roe. And of course, the ACA now. Um, you know, Jeff, Jeff Emerson asks again, you know, Dennis, given your comments about the court's lack of interest in creating these cascading issues of law um, as a result of a Supreme Court decision, what is the likelihood, do you think, that, this, that the court will strike down all of the ACA uh, versus a portion? And Nancy, of course, feel free to weigh in on that as well. The ACA, to me, is a fascinating uh, case of what does it mean to be a conservative? Uh, in other words, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals from which this case uh, comes, challenging the constitutionality of, of the ACA, uh, was a two, two to one decision. And it, it held that since there was no longer a mandate uh, to purchase uh, health insurance uh, that uh, Chief Justice Roberts' analysis of this uh, being constitutional under the taxing power uh, was now destroyed, and thus, and the thus is the big point, the whole act has to fail. 
Uh, well, that's a non sequitur uh, because a court could equally hold that Congress made the decision that it didn't want to impose this requirement uh, of uh, a mandatory fee uh, and would give the beneficiary the opportunity of either purchasing health insurance or paying nothing. You know, the Congress occasionally sets up uh, mandates that don't require you to do anything so you're off the hook. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, one could conclude and there are uh, several briefs uh, that argue this point in one fashion or another before the court. Uh, well, the mandate uh, of being unconstitutional is now severable from the rest of the statutes, the severability doctrine. So you knock that out and under that doctrine, unless the court concludes that uh, Congress meant the whole act to fail when one part of it came out, uh, it should be decisive uh, of its validity. Uh, and then if you plug in another doctrine, you know, there are doctrines galore uh, surrounding this case, uh, and that's uh, the constitutional avoidance doctrine. That is, courts say that we don't decide constitutional questions unless absolutely necessary to the result of the case. Uh, you combine severability and constitutional avoidance and the conservative response is to let the act stand. So take a close look uh, at uh, what uh, Justice Barrett does. The truly conservative mood, which is for limited judicial interference with what democratically accountable branches uh, uh, produce hmm. uh, is to say hands off uh, doctrine one and doctrine two equal uh, no invalidation. Nancy, what do you think? I, I think that Dennis has really hit the heart of that, uh, that issue. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you, uh, you have to wonder, I think, um, or I have to wonder, there, severability came up during Justice Barrett's hearings. I didn't hear anyone talk about constitutional avoidance. And I think, Dennis, you are absolutely correct that that is one of the, the large lurking issues out there in the shadows um, when you talk about the ACA. Um, so it's hard to, to predict how it will go because of the differing ways in which people who define themselves as having a conservative philosophy or a conservative approach or a textualist or in the statutory context and add to that the originalism in the constitutional context, how they, how they see that in any particular circumstance. But I think Dennis is exactly right to point out that, that those two traditional doctrines can constrain what it is you would do in this case in a way that has you step back and just let the act chug along. Great. You know, uh, we've sort of touched on, we've brushed up against the idea of religious freedom um, in several answers, in part because of Justice Barrett's views on religious, uh, right, religious rights, religious freedoms. Michael Rice asks, you know, from vis-a-vis in, in, -vis the Constitution and a legal point of view, what rights do you think that Christian groups could argue that they have lost over the past few decades to the extent that they, you think that they have lost them under the Constitution? Um, Whoever would like to go first, please go ahead. With a caveat at the start that I'm not a legal scholar as Dennis is. Um, so what I know about analysis of the First Amendment, I have learned by going line by line with my trusty pen through the work of scholars um, as I, I prepare it for, uh, for publication. But it seems to me that that rights themselves have not been lost. Um, I think, and this is just my <laughs> spinning off and, and projecting, but it, it seems to me it's more a loss of possibly uh, nomenclature, it's a loss of status, it's a loss of 
an atmosphere that was always there that is suddenly gone, but rights that are gone, I, I think we have seen little, if any, of that. And now, Dennis, I will stop and defer to you. Well, in a way, at, at one level, that uh, is a hard point to argue with. Uh, I, I really don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, I really don't. And part of the reason is the dissonance between the law and the books and uh, dare I call it the law on the streets, uh, the law in the living rooms, the law on the churches, uh, because the law is only as effective uh, uh, as it is when it's observed. Yes. And it's observed uh, without having to be vindicated by a temporary restraining order or a mandatory uh, injunction. Uh, and it would be my hope at some point uh, that American society can move away from thinking that the quick solution to this social problem or that uh, is uh, to file a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, not what we've inherited over the last 50 years. So in a sense, and this uh, harkens back to what I said earlier, uh, we're a victim of our own success and of the uh, energies of uh, the legal industry uh, in ingenuity and in rounding up clients. Yes, yes, which we, we saw in the Harvard case. Now, I wanna make sure I get to this question because multiple people have asked, Kimberly Damon, Ben Vanell. Uh, I'll ask it as two parts. One, what do you think the chances are that Democrats will move to pack the courts to expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court in order to quote unquote rebalance it so it's not because they're conservative? And do you think that they should? I think court packing would be a disaster because essentially what it would confess is that what we care about is the ideology of uh, people that we nominate and uh, confirm uh, and the devil take the hindmost on the so-called rule of law. Now it's preposterous to uh, think that judges have no views, that they're like umpires calling balls and strikes. Uh, in fact, uh, umpires create strike zones, as any baseball or softball player uh, will tell you. Uh, but once you take away the idea of neutrality, uh, you uh, suck a dagger into the heart uh, of the rule of law. Uh, and I think it's a terrible mistake to even consider it. Uh, and I would uh, point back to 1937. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt tried it once. Uh, he got safely reelected uh, and he, he never attacked the court uh, while he was campaigning for reelection. He won and then he said that he was going to increase the efficiency of the institution uh, by appointing uh, a justice for anyone then sitting 70 uh, or over. Well, that would have given him six seats. Uh, so in a 15 person court, uh, he's got an 11 to four majority. Uh, and the results were disastrous. Uh, the democratic coalition, and we tend to forget uh, what a fragile coalition it was then uh, between uh, labor, uh, uh, farmers, uh, conservative uh, elements in society, uh, <coughs> excuse me, absolutely split apart. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt, you know, the great dexterous politician, played it very bad politically. He only talked to one uh, uh, Judiciary Committee uh, chairman uh, and uh, failed to talk to the other. And of course, what he failed uh, uh, to take into account uh, was the easy uh, challenge, which is, well, uh, this requires a constitutional amendment. Well, it doesn't. By statute, the court size is set by Congress, but it's an argument that just throws sand in the face uh, of those who uh, want the court size to change since it's been stable since the Judiciary Act of 1869. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think it would be a terrible mistake. Uh, the more realistic solutions 
which preserve the idea of a neutral rule of law are ones that are much harder. Uh, and that's, uh, say, term limits, uh, 18 years. That's been proposed several times in the last few years. But that would require, I think, everyone agrees, a constitutional amendment. Since now the Constitution says the judges can sit during good behavior. So I, I, I hope that the idea uh, uh, dies and dies fairly quickly. It would be a shame to waste energy on something uh, that I think would have uh, too many negative consequences. I think just in setting up the next <laughs> one, I'm going to combine Kim Burgess and John Claiborne's questions, but in setting it up, I think we do need to remember um, that what has happened that's created such a conservative court did not happen because of the Trump administration at all. It was a decades long project yes. through which we saw the Federal Society move from the fringes <coughs> to the over the course of four decades, where we saw senators and Republicans make it their project to try to get more conservative justices put onto the bench and you know at the district and appellate levels far you know longer than they've been working on SCOTUS because there aren't a lot of SCOTUS seats that come up all the time. So this is not a Trump phenomenon. And I just want to make sure that we think about that as we think about you know the democratic, the current democratic focus on rebalancing the courts. If they were to do it in this, if they were to try to do it and they didn't pack the courts, Truly, what they would have to do is they would have to have that same exact long term sort of thinking amongst politicians and amongst voters to make it an issue that they work on for. I mean, this took decades. It really did take decades. And now we have this flurry of appointments of conservative judges um, at the district and appeals court levels under Trump. Uh, you know, I think that Kim has answered her own question, you know, saying, will this impact? Um, you know, how, what impact will this have on lawyers groups who want to pave the way for equal rights for minorities and LGBTQ? It seems these efforts may be stopped very early in their judicial tracks. And that is probably true. But what the flip side of that is, is that it then opens up cases that are far more uh, conservative leaning, which would dial back equal rights for minorities and LGBTQ in the same way that they were once opened up. So with Alito and Thomas, who've been very vocal in their disagreement with recent decisions on the court supporting the rights of LGBTQ citizens, LGBTQ people in America, do you foresee the Supreme Court reopening any cases challenging those rights as established by the court in the next year? Or do you see the court being amenable to taking on a case if it can wind its way up through the district and appeals levels that Kim rightly points out have become more conservative? There's another factor to keep in mind, Katie, and that is uh, we talk about uh, conservative justices being appointed uh, by uh, President Trump. Think about the lower federal courts, 230 confirmed judges at the appellate level and at the trial court level. Uh, and they've all been vetted by the Federalist Society. I mean, you know, it is the great takeover of one of the three uh, institutions of government. Uh, and so what does that mean in the end? It means uh, that as uh, justices not appointed under uh, the president's aegis uh, begin to retire, uh, that these 230 judges are going to dominate the creation uh, of uh, precedent and resolution of litigation. And that means that more conservative uh, decisions that are made can come up to a Supreme Court and say, boy, that looks pretty good. Yeah, no, nope, cert denied. Uh, no, we don't have to review that. No, that's fully consistent with our precedent, which is the same thing that the Warren Court did in the early to mid 1960s with respect to liberal decisions made by lower federal courts with respect to the administration of Brown and the Board of Education. Uh, what gets to the Supreme Court comes from somewhere. Uh, and uh, that is going to be the phenomenon that we need to uh, worry about over time. I, I want to let every, oh, sorry, please, Nancy, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I may be a day or two behind the um, activity cycle on this, but I believe that the only opening on the federal courts of appeals today 
is the one left by the transition of Judge Barrett into Justice Barrett, which is astonishing. And I, I would say um, that you characterize um, people as being concerned about these judicial appointments occurring under Trump and they have occurred under Trump. But I think it is a fuller truth to say that these appointments occurred under McConnell. The, uh, the majority leader held the vacancies that appeared during the Obama administration, particularly the second term Obama administration, deliberately held them open. Attention is focused on the Merrick Garland debacle and rightly so, that was a, an astonishing um, tactical maneuver, but as it turned out, quite effective. Um, and this was also quite effective, but Mitch McConnell refused to allow those judgeship vacancies to be filled, which is really quite surprising right. because one always hears that there, there is a great need for more judges. And, and usually that is true. You, you always do need to fill, but instead of keeping that regular routine going. Uh, uh, that uh, shows uh, a constitution being held up by an elderly man saying, and article three to you, courtesy of Senator McConnell. Uh, he's just been instrumental uh, from start to finish. And by the way, uh, there is a nomination already to fill Amy Cohen Barrett's oh. position on the Seventh Circuit. A uh, very conservative lawyer from Indiana. Thank you very much. But, and, and that is, Katie, as you pointed out, that's the system at work. They, they had I, I, someone I, in mind for that seat. And then there you are, yes. And it's, it's, I want to give everybody just to, to let you know, we only have about seven minutes left and we have a lot of questions. So what I'm going to do is in wrap, we, we will begin wrapping up in a minute, but I'm, I'm going to continue to combine some of these questions a little bit. We probably have time for one more topic and it is the theme of politics because we have, again, sort of touched on it a little bit, but not really gone directly at it. Um, a lot of questions are coming in around politics. Elizabeth wants to know, can we just no longer use the words liberal or conservative? Um, to, uh, you know, are there better words to describe the approach that justice is taking these very inflammatory words? You know, there's an acknowledgement that politics is extremely toxic right now, even as we try to deal with this idea that justices under the constitution are not to be swayed by politics, right? They're the branch of government that's not supposed to be political per se, and yet, is because of what we've seen, especially since the 1940s and 50s in the United States, they've been thrust into politics, they've set policy and they've set agendas. So taking all of these, putting them together, um, you know, this idea of politics, it's inescapable at this point, but what is your feeling about the way that the court is going to, especially because of the chief justice, respond to political pressures over the next term? Um, will we see, uh, you know, will, what do you expect to see from Amy Coney Barrett herself vis-a-vis -vis politics? You know, like all people during her nomination, she really refused to weigh in. Are there any places where you think politically she will be um, the strongest or more, most assertive? Let's just do those two things together. And then I think that'll probably be most of our time. Well, I'll start with just a, a little comment, Dennis, and then I'll, I'll let you carry on. But um, I was struck, I had to go back and look this up because I wasn't sure whether it was something I had made up or something I had actually seen. Um, Thurgood Marshall years ago in a, an oral history project relatively late in his life, talked at, at some length and about a, the day on which President Johnson let him know that he was going to be nominated for the Supreme Court. And at the end of that conversation, um, they discussed um, their relationship. They had been professional friends for years. And uh, they said to each other, I guess this is the end of that. And they said, yep. And then Marshall says in this oral history, and that's the way it was. And I, I have no reason to doubt that, that, that in fact, whatever political favor, and as we know, President Johnson was famous for leaning on people for political favors, that that never happened. Um, you know, are there people on the bench today who feel beholden to others for political favors? I don't know. I, I like to think 
No, I am an institutionalist and to some extent a starry-eyed idealist about the courts. That's why I ended up doing what I did. Um, but it's it's hard to know. And so because this is a hard question, I'm going to stop talking and let Dennis carry on. The problem is for every example, such as one you gave, there's at least uh, one counterexample. Yes. Uh, and uh, you can do that with uh, Johnson himself. Uh, Abe Fortas frequently appeared at the White House, yes. talked to Johnson about foreign policy, uh, war policy, after he was appointed to the Supreme Court. Absolutely outrageous. Uh, Warren Berger uh, would consult with President Nixon from time to time about cases that were coming up in the direction that the court was uh, heading. Uh, it, it really gets down to a matter of individual integrity. And, you know, for every one of your examples, I can give you two counterexamples. Sure. Sadly. Uh, now, having said that, uh, to answer the question that Katie's putting more directly, uh, and that is, uh, what are, you know, the, the so-called conservatives, whatever name you want to put on, I'm going to do. Uh, they're very ideological. Uh, you know, when you read uh, Barrett's non-judicial writings, you read uh, some of Kavanaugh's uh, uh, opinions, uh, you know, they have a very distinct, you know, view uh, of uh, government behavior, of uh, the courts uh, and the like. And I'm tempted to say that they may see uh, the judicial chair they hold uh, as an opportunity rather than as a duty. Mm. That's what worries me more than anything. So on that note, first of all, I want to say that we at Bowdoin are incredibly lucky to have such engaged alumni, faculty, students. There are still many questions in the queue. And, uh, you know, um, I, I will probably just throw them over to Dennis and Nancy afterwards so that we can talk about it. But it seems like we have plenty of of material here for another for a follow up, and Kim asked if we could uh, do a follow up in a year to see where things have gone with the court with the Justice Barrett. That might be fun. And again, we have pl plenty of questions coming in. But I do want to thank so all first of all the audience for joining and being incredibly engaged. Um, I would expect nothing less. Uh, I want to thank Mackie O'Keefe for our introduction and for all the work he's doing at Bowdoin and that's making the school just such an interesting intellectual place. Rhody Lloyd, um, thank you so much and thank you to the Bowdoin Alumni Office and, and Sarah as well for hosting us today and thank you to the college for hosting us. Thank you to Dennis and Nancy for spending time today. I know it's a really busy moment. We're heading, we're just days out to the election. And I think that it was also a really nice break for everybody to get to sort of like dig into something and, you know, have a great smart conversation about a topic that is not about um, uh, Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden per se. So it was a wonderful hour. Wonderful to see you all. There need to be more conversations like this. Yes. Yeah. We'll need to be harder about this stuff. It's just, it was a great opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody Katie. Have a good afternoon and a great week. Yes, thank okay, you, Katie. Fair. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you.